We are continued in the Gospel of Matthew. If you've uh, been with us for a while, we are beginning chapter 9 today. So if you uh, would like to follow along in your Bible, uh, that's where we're going to be at. And today we're going to do kind of an overview of the whole chapter because the way that Matthew writes it is that there's this overview and then it comes to the end of the chapter, which really gets to the heart of the matter. But then we'll go back in the next couple of weeks and, and go through each of the, the stories a little bit more carefully because there's a lot that is in there. But before we get going, have you ever wondered how other people spend their day? Because I don't know about you, but I spend a, a lot of time, you know, just you know, doing my job and, and kind of going about it without anyone else's involvement. And uh, I've often wondered how other people, you know, what they do with their day, how, what they do at work. I find it strange, for example, that the person I know the best, which would be my wife, uh, spends hours every day doing something which I really have very little knowledge of what it is that she does. You know, she's, a, she's been a teacher for years, so she has spent hundreds if not thousands of hours, you know, with students, doing her job, doing things that I really have no clue what's going on there. Uh, when we were in Oregon, uh, one time she was teaching by driving uh, around our county uh, hours of driving, spending time with students, trying to get them to actually do their work. And she would show me places that she had been later on, like would be driving around. She'd go, oh, I went to a school there. Oh, I've done that here. And, uh, and I just kind of realized I really have no idea what goes on in the life of my own wife, let alone in the life of, of other people uh, that are my friends or even my family or your church members. And at IBCD, you know, we have all kinds of people. We have people who are students, of various different types. We have engineering students. We have music students. Uh, we have pilots for, we've had in the past pilots for FedEx. Uh, we've had military folks, police officers, business people, doctors, lawyers, housewives, house husbands. You know, we have all these different things going on. And, uh, and Sunday is really just kind of this place where our lives intersect for a few hours, and then we go off and we do our own thing again. Then we come back, we intersect for a while, then we go off and do our own thing. Well, Jesus uh, lived a life that was very real and within history upon earth. And in the Gospel of Matthew today, uh, chapter 9 is really kind of a day in the life of the Messiah. And the way that Matthew talks about it is that he takes incidents, and this is where you have to be okay with the way that people viewed history and wrote history back in the time of, of Christ, uh, that they didn't necessarily take chronological order in the way that we expect history in the 21st century to be written in chronological order. They would often take historical events, but arrange them in such a way that it would, that it would lead to the point that they want to lead to. And Matthew does that. And, uh, but as he goes through it, he does something kind of interesting. He attaches each of these stories as if the end begins to overlap with the beginning of the next one. And he uses these words of activity, these active verbs. And we're just going to go through chapter 9 and show you what I'm talking about. So it actually begins, the story actually begins in verse 2, because as we looked at last week, verse 1, Jesus stepped into the boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. That really ends the previous section, where Jesus had gotten into the boat, crossed the Sea of Galilee, dealt with the people who were the, uh, the possessed by the demons, and then he gets back in the boat and comes over. Then there's a kind of a pause between verse 1 and 2. And I've told you in the past that the, the chapter and verses, numbers, those were put in well after the gospel was written. So we have to be a little careful of letting the numbers of the chapters and the verses dictate the rhythm in which you read the scripture. You need to, in some ways, just read it by removing those numbers, and you'll find there's a rhythm there that sometimes the chapter and verse thing interrupts. And that's what happens here in verse 1. This, this verse really is connected to the previous story. And then there's a pause, and then Matthew begins these series of e events. And he takes them in a different order. And the first one is the, the paralytic. And in, Matt, and in Mark and in Luke, we're told this person is lowered through the roof to come to Jesus. But Matthew doesn't include that. It says this. Some men brought to him a paralytic lying on the mat. And then there's this story where Jesus talks about your sins are forgiven and all this. And then the scripture says in verse 9, and as he went from there, so you see how Matthew will kind of ends, he ends the story about the paralytic with this phrase, as he went from there, as if as one ends, Jesus is walking out the door, 
A man, came, yeah, he saw a man named Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth. And then there's a story where he talks with Matthew and tells him to follow him. And then as he's talking with Matthew, and Matthew takes him to his home for a dinner, and Jesus is talking to the tax collectors, which was a big deal because he's, you know, people didn't like that he was associating with the tax collectors because they were considered sinners. While he's having this conversation, John the Baptist's disciples show up. And the way that Matthew tells it, it's while he's having dinner and he's just finishing the conversation with Matthew and his friends when John the Baptist's disciples show up. And they continue part of the conversation Jesus has been having about fasting and about celebrating. And they say to him, you know, well, how is the Pharisees fast? We fast, but your disciples don't fast. And then Jesus talks to him about that. And then in, in verse 18, it says, while he was saying this, so as he's finishing up his conversation with John the Baptist's disciples, a ruler came and knelt before him and said, my daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. So then Jesus got up and went with them. So you get this, just this continuous flow of action. And as he's going with her, just then, a woman who had been subjected to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. And then Jesus turns around and has a conversation with her. And then he finally gets to the ruler's house, when he entered the ruler's house, he throws out the people, he raises her from the dead, and then just as he went from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, have mercy on us, son of David. So Jesus stops, and he deals with them, and talks with them about things, and then while he was going out from talking with them, a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. And there's just this bam, 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 this this continuous flow of action throughout the day of Jesus. And then the chapter 9 ends with this. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. And really what you have in those previous verses of chapter 9 is examples of him doing all these things. And it's basically saying this was what Jesus' life was like. He got up in the morning, and there were people needing him, wanting him, wanting to hear from him teaching, wanting him to heal, wanting him to cast out demons. They, they had a lot of, of demands on him, and Jesus kind of went around and did all these things. And it wasn't just this one day saying, this is what it was like. He went through all the towns and villages, and he would teach in the synagogues. He preached the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness. And there was kind of this breath. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and they were helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And at the end of chapter 9, you really get to the point that Matthew is making, is that Jesus Jesus lived this very active and busy life, and it was just moving forward constantly. There were demands being made on him constantly. There's this frantic pace that goes on. And then there's this kind of this breath where Jesus looks out at all, that, all the work that there is to do, and he turns to his disciples and says, man, the harvest is plentiful. There's a lot to do. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send workers into his field. And when I look at how Jesus lived, when I, when I look at how he approached his life, and especially this last bit that the harvest is plentiful, I began to ask myself this question, and I want to ask you this question. Do you believe the harvest is plentiful? When you think of your own life, and I'm just asking you to reflect on your own life, right now, I think we would all say that, yeah, there are plenty of people that need to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And there are plenty of folks in the world that could, could use the life-transforming power of Jesus Christ. You have people in your family. You have people who are friends that could all use it. But what I mean by this is the harvest plentiful. Is do you find yourself having opportunity to share the good news of Christ several times throughout every day of your life? Do you find that this is the case? That you have people that are coming to you saying, I need to hear words of hope. I need to know, you know, what I need, you know, how my life can be transformed for the better. I need to know about good news, the gospel. Do you have people coming to you and wanting to know this from you? Do they come to you looking to you for answers? Do you have opportunities to share the gospel with, you, with people several times throughout each day? I think most of us would say no. That's not the case that we don't have this kind of plentiful, that it's just like there's so many opportunities to reach out and work for the Lord in our lives. In fact, I think some of us would say, you know, I really haven't shared the gospel with anyone for a long time, if ever. 
And this idea that the harvest is plentiful, we kind of tend to think of that as sort of this metaphor, but don't really know if, if, we can, if we're really all that personally involved in it. And I would say of myself, I don't really feel like I lead others to Christ very often. Because I really don't have much to do with unbelievers. I mean, I'll just tell you my own life. My own life is almost exclusively spent with Christians. Almost exclusively. And that shouldn't be unusual, given that I'm a pastor, and that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be shepherding a church. But you know, the truth is, statistics show, and the statistics of the church have been done over and over and over against the U.S., that when a person becomes a believer in their adult years or teen later teenage years, the most effective time for them to be evangelists are within the first few months in the first year or two of their faith. Do you know why that is? Because they still have connections with non-believers. They were non-believers. Then they became a believer. But most of their friends, their social group, everyone around them are still non-believers. And, and also, those new Christians, their little tails are wagging. They're full of excitement. The, the newness of what Christ has done in their life has just impacted their life and changed their life. And they talk about it. And that's the most effective time for evangelism is those first few years. After that, if you do not make an effort as a Christian to continually cultivate relationships with non-believers, then after five years, they found after five years, your entire social structure will change and almost all your friends are exclusively Christians. Why is that? Well, because that's who you start hanging out with. You start hanging out with like-minded people. You start making friends in church. You start being around folks who, who are believers. And so instead of going to dinner with this group, group of folks that aren't believers, you start going with this group that are believers because you have more in common and you want to talk about your faith and you're excited about growing. You start taking that home group time and, and many of you are busy. Taking a little time out of the week just to meet with someone else is hard enough when it's a home group, let alone someone that you might not really have all that much in common with anymore. And so your social circles change. And the fields are still ripe for the harvest. Those folks that you knew and were close to you still need to know Christ. But you've kind of been removed from their life. And it's not anyone's fault. It's not your fault. It's not, this is just what happens. And unless we make a conscious effort as believers to be involved in non-believers' lives then pretty soon you're going to find your whole social circle is non-believers. I mean, is believers. And again, it's not a horrible thing to have your social circle be believers, but it's hard to lead believers to Christ. You can help them. You can, you can encourage them along the way. But it's not going to be a place where you see that, that soul transformation from death to life. And when I look at how Jesus lived, Jesus was a man who was very generous with his time and with his presence. You ever notice how he just, he just met people's needs without making demands? He was kind. He was merciful. Now, it's super helpful that he had this miraculous power that he could walk up to folks and he could cast out a demon or he could do a healing in their life. He could, he could address those needs right away. And I think part of the reason why he could do that was obviously he's the word of God made flesh dwelt among us. You know, he has that miraculous divine power. But also, Jesus had three years. And I think Jesus knew his mission on earth was going to be about three years. He had to get the ball rolling here. And, uh, and so he took care of things in a, in a manner which I think we would love to be able to take care of. I would love to be able to walk around and just heal folks. That would be great. But I can't. But what I can do is I can involve myself in people's lives in a real and meaningful manner. And when I say involve myself in their lives, is that you, you really, you're, not the, you're not looking at unbelievers as a, as a project to bring to Christ, but you are genuinely involved in their life. And I don't know about you, but when I was a young man and first became a believer, I, was, I had a wonderful experience in my university uh, with this campus Christian group and with the church that was attached to it, and wonderful folks, met my wife, all this. But I didn't realize how insulated and in kind of Christian bubble I had, I had built for myself until I joined the Peace Corps. And the Peace Corps is a U.S. organization which is secular. There's no... It's not attached to any kind of church or faith. We happened to be sent to a very evangelized country in Lesotho, but that wasn't really the, the, the point of the Peace Corps. And it was when I was in the Peace Corps, I began to realize that I had no emotional connections with anyone who wasn't a believer. I had no friends. I had no loves. 
my family, my mom and dad were believers. My wife was a believer. Uh, my sister at the time seemed to be, and I don't know where she is at right now, so I can't really say. But at that time, my, uh, the people I loved were all believers. My closest friend was a believer, and my closest friends in the university were believers. And I realized that I didn't give a fig about any of these people who were fellow volunteers, people I was staying with and going through training with. And, I, and it kind of made me realize, you know, this place that I was at. And God began to work with me. And I formed a friendship with this British guy and this German guy and another American guy when I was in my, at, at our site, who I'm still in contact with today. A German guy lives near Ostenbrook. And uh, the British guy is in England somewhere. And, uh, and we've seen him since we've been here. And that friendship that was developed with these unbelievers was deep, and it was meaningful. And I cared about them regardless of the fact that they were believers or non-believers. I cared about them, and I still do. And in some ways, I'm still involved in their life. But the important thing is it made me realize in this fairly early stage of my faith, if I don't take and make the attempt to be involved in people's lives, I simply won't. Because my character is an introvert. And the involvement that I have to have in believers' lives is draining enough. Draining enough. In fact, I find sometimes being involved in believers' lives far more draining than being involved in unbelievers' lives. Because the demands are different. And I could say, well, that's, I'm just built differently than Jesus. Jesus was an extrovert. I'm an introvert. But there are times when it's not enough to say, this isn't just the way I am. There's times when you have to say, this is the way I am, but it needs to change. And for me, this is something that needs to change. I need to, to try to involve myself in the lives of, of people around me. In our apartment building, as I was thinking about this through this week, our apartment building has, these, has a multi-generational thing going on. There's a family, and, a, and I think, is, is their parents live in a different apartment? And I've, and I've come across them several times, asked their names several times. I can't remember their names. And they just live across. They live like, you know, less than 10 meters away. I mean, I can socially distance and, 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 and still be within, you know, as close as they are to me sometimes. Whose fault is that? What's mine? That's not just the way I am. That's just me saying, what's your name? And looking at that person and in somewhere in my mind going, I have no intention of ever really being involved in your life whatsoever. So the name goes in one ear and right out the other because there's no reason to keep it in here because I have no intention of being involved in their life. That has to change. And I think a lot of us have situations like this where there are opportunities that are there. And I've noticed throughout the years of my life that the people who want to be involved in people's lives are involved in people's lives because it's not that hard to get involved. You just need to show that you care, genuinely care. And there's so much thirst out there for people that care about others that you'll find yourself being involved in their lives. And so how do you live your life? I've told you about mine. I made my big confession to you. How about you? How do you live your life? Do you live your life involving yourself in the lives of unbelievers? I would, I would encourage a lot of you who are students, you know, you're surrounded by unbelievers a lot of times, and you have to work with them. You have to be with them in class. You have to do projects with them. Take the opportunity to know them beyond class. Take the opportunity to know them beyond projects. For those of you who work with colleagues, I know this is kind of this weird German colleague. There's my colleagues, and there's my friends, and there's this big gap in between. But you can still work to be part of people's lives. But understand, the operative word is work. Because being involved in other people's lives is work. It is work. And if you aren't willing to put in the work, then you're going to come across as uncaring when the need is called upon. When that person decides to trust you with something, you go, eh, I'm not really, I don't really want to get out of my chair today. Then that is going to be perceived as uncaring. So understand that, yeah, the harvest is plentiful. And the workers are few. But if you're going to be called to be a worker in that harvest field, then you need to know that you are a worker. You're not an observer. You're a worker. And when Jesus said, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send workers into his field, who is he talking to? 
He was talking to his disciples. He was talking to people who were going to be workers. So he basically tells the workers, you need to pray for more people to come help, which brings us to the second part of the question. How often do you pray for people to come to faith? How often do you pray for someone that you know is not a believer? By name, how often do you pray? Privately or publicly? It doesn't really matter. How often do you pray for that person to come to faith? Again, I would submit that many of you would say, not very often. You know people who are unbelievers. Maybe, probably, you all have family members that are unbelievers. We do. Cindy and I have family members that are unbelievers. How often do you pray for them to come to faith? Really? What about people you know that you work with who are unbelievers? How often by name do you pray they come to faith? Or your, or your fellow students, how often by name do you pray they come to faith? I know some of you hang out with unbelievers all the time. Some of you do have unbelievers who are friends. Because you're teenagers or you're college students or you're whatever, that you tend to have more of that, that mix. How often do you pray for them? By name to come to faith. How often do you ask for workers to enter into the field? Probably not very often, right? And I wonder sometimes, do we not have because we do not ask? You know, the scripture says, you, have because, you don't have because you don't ask. James, he kind of blasts the church. He goes, you, you don't have because you don't ask. And when you do ask, you ask with the wrong intentions. <laughs> you know? But if we just kind of cut off that, that second part and just say, how often do we ask for people to come to know Christ? I used to be challenged by this young lady named Katie who was a, a missionary for a while uh, overseas. And, and she, would, she would pray for a person by name. And, and, and I used to think that maybe she was doing something wrong because she would badger God. She would like whine to God. God, I don't understand why this person's not coming to Christ. The scripture says that you love this person. You died for this person. That your desire is for this person to come to salvation. Why aren't they saved, Lord? Lord, you need to get to work on this. And I used to be like, ooh, we can't talk to God like that. But you know what? More people came to know Christ because of her, her interaction with them than I saw in most people. Because she, she prayed. She wanted this. She wasn't satisfied that people were just dying and going to hell. She didn't separate it out in her mind that we often do as Christians. Well, there's what we believe and then there's what we experience. Because you know, we do that. The scripture says it's, it's God's desire that none should perish. And we go, okay, I believe that. But then we look around us and we see that people are going to hell and perishing all the time. And somewhere in our brains, we kind of disconnect these two things. We disconnect the scripture from reality that we're experiencing. And we're okay with that. We're pretty much okay with that. Until someone challenges us from the outside. And then we go, oh, I don't know why I really think this way, but I do. We need to make that connection. If it's God's desire that none should perish, then it should be our desire that none should perish. And if we're not even willing to pray for the people we know to come to Christ, then how can we expect there to be a flood of people coming to know Jesus Christ? And when I, when I, it maybe sounds like I'm like, meh, 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 you, it, believe me, it all comes back to me too. So what we can do? What can we do? Well, they're simple things, because I know sometimes we get all fired up and we say, I'm going to be praying three hours a day for the non-believers, and that lasts for exactly one day. And then we, we go, well, that, that was awful, and we never want to approach that again. What are the simple things you can do? Well, if you pray, you know, if you have, if you have a time of prayer in your home groups, you make a list within your home groups of people that, that you know that aren't believers, and every time your home group meets, Pray through that list. And maybe take the time of the names in the list to actually contact them. Contact them. People like to be contacted. I'm surprised that people like to be contacted by me. It's kind of a funny thing. You'd think I'd be all confident about this, but I'm not. I contacted my cousin about two months ago. I'm supposed to be doing it on a monthly basis now. He was thrilled to hear from me after almost 15 years of silence. Yeah? He really, he was happy to hear from me. Contact people that you know aren't believers. Pray for them. Don't, t don't necessarily contact them and say, I'm going to pray for you right now. But start forming the relationship again. If you pray before meals, some of you do, just throw in a name. Don't make, make these simple changes that you can sustain as you make habit changes. And then as those little habits change, maybe greater habits will change. And maybe you will get to the point where you pray for an hour for people that don't know 
Christ. But don't be that. Don't try and start the marathon on day one. Achieve the goals you can. And it's pretty simple to pray for someone before a meal. It's pretty simple to pray for someone uh, in your home group. It's pretty simple to get back involved. Because you are the answer to prayer. Or you should be as a disciple. You are the worker that, we're, that someone prayed to the Lord of the harvest would bring to the field. And you have to ask yourself, am I working in the field? Or am I just kind of standing around and watching? I think that if we would make these simple changes in our lives, then we would see a difference in our faith. And I believe it's important, especially for a lot of you are, young, are parents of young kids. And my kids have kind of grown up, and I think every generation thinks this, but I look to the generation that is growing up and the years that they face ahead of them, and it's going to be tough. Because the world, as if looking around today in the room is in any indication, is getting stranger and stranger every year. And this is just bizarre, the situation we're in right now, isn't it? I mean, it's become almost normal, right? I say it's bizarre, and most people I look at your faces like, meh. No, this is weird. You know? We're used to this place being full. We're used to hearing kids running around and, and laughing and, and disturbing the service. <laughs> you know? That's what we're used to. And now we have more people here, but it's still this. It's different. And the whole world is different. And then we have, you know, the politics of hate that, that, that our kids are having to enter. You have the extreme left wing that says you must not only tolerate, but celebrate lifestyles which are clearly against the scripture and immoral. And then you have the far right that says, and you should hate, you should be racist, and you should pour your venom out upon these folks that the left says that you're supposed to celebrate. And it's just this cycle of sin that comes from both directions at the same time. And our kids are going to have to navigate this. And young people are going to have to navigate this. And, and the church is not responding very well, by the way, in my opinion. The church either pulls far to the left or far to the right because they don't have their mind and centered upon what their faith is about. They don't understand who it is that they're about, who they're trying to emulate. And so they just get pulled all over the place, and the church is even losing its moral guidance. How is that going to change? Well, the only way it's going to change is if we change. And you, can't, you can't expect great change in the church without individual change taking place within the church. And you are that individual change. You are. I can make these changes. I will try. But you need to also be involved in this. You can pray for people who are lost just as well as I can. You can be involved in people's lives just as well as I can. You don't have to have all the theological answers to everything. Just show that you care. And you'll have the opportunity to eventually bring them to a place where they can have those answers. The fields are ripe for the harvest. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send workers into the harvest field. And as you pray that prayer, may you be willing to also be the answer to that prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what you have given us in your word to follow you. And Lord, as we look at this day that Matthew kind of presents, it's a day that is just from dawn till dusk, constantly being involved in the work of the Lord, being involved in the kingdom work. And Lord God, as we look at our lives, and I include myself in this, it's, I don't live that same way. And maybe that's good because it'd be exhausting to do for much longer than three years, which you were here doing. But Father, forgive us for the complacency. And I know maybe I just speak for myself, but there is certainly a complacency in doing the simple things, which is to pray. Pray for people that we know that don't know you. To, to be actively and truly involved in the lives of people that don't know you. You know, to be that helping hand, to be the person. We can't, maybe some of us, most of us, I don't know anyone here who can heal miraculously, but we certainly can be a helping hand, a soothing hand, a hand of 
to help with the hurt in people's lives. And Father, as we, as we seek to be these hands and feet, you know, remember the, the letter of James that says, faith without works is dead, and that we're not supposed to be trying to work our way to salvation, but a faith that does not express itself in the way that you expressed yourself is really not really a faith in Jesus Christ. It's a faith maybe in a philosophy or faith in a church or faith in a book. But we want to have faith in you, the living God. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us to emulate you, that we would be willing to have you be our model, and that our Lord Jesus Christ, you would manifest yourself through the Holy Spirit in our lives and in places where we are resistant, and I know I have my places where I'm resistant, that you would break down those barriers just with the philosophy of love, really. Because for my, my barrier of resistance is often I just don't really, I'm just lazy or tired. And that you could break that down by saying there's, a very, there's something greater here and help us to live that something greater. Maybe some of us are resistant because we're afraid. We're afraid of what people will think of us. Lord, may your love break down that barrier and say you, you can help someone and they're going to always appreciate it. You don't have to beat them over the head with the Bible in the first discussion you have with them. And Lord, help us to live the way you lived. When I look at these stories, there's only the first story that he really, you really address sin. After that, you're just healing people. You're meeting their needs where they're at, at that time, so they can listen to you later. And God, may we have the same understanding. And help us to live the lifestyle of a harvester in the field. To bring you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.